What lengths would you go to save your infected offspring? Much like earning a Klondike bar, would the weight of your horrific decisions come crashing down on you as you look to the sky and scream about what sort of god would allow this? The alternative is also just not eating the Klondike bar. Now that I sound completely unhinged, working the labs will do that. On the heels of two parents splitting over basically both of them being complete tools, it's really the younglings who suffer. As a mother and offspring head out into the plains of, I think, Iowa, the youngish pre-adults would then find a tree in a dry lake bed and on just looks absolutely horrible. Burn that immediately. This tree, however, would contain something within it that would not bode well for anybody or anyone or anything that was alive in the immediate area. So in today's episode, let's discuss the vampire disease from blood and figure out how it alters the human genome as well as what are the implications of this spreading and the science behind if there is an imperfect host scenario based on what we find. So we're gonna be trying something different with this one. As you know, copyright plagues this channel like a herpes outbreak before a date. And it seems that only it's getting worse despite clearly being protected under US Law 17 USCA Section 512. In fact, I actually just got a copyright strike from uh, a South Korean company who clearly does not own the copyright for a movie. So based on the company's complete disregard for the law, the style of this video is changed up slightly. Let me know what you guys think. We open up our story on a dry lake bed, a skeleton and a creepy desiccated tree in the center. A recently broken up family is moving with the sun absolutely not helping to bring any of the boxes in. Like a right proper tool. Look, all I'm saying is I had to move around a lot as a pre-adult myself and I would have been chastised for not helping. Like that wasn't even an option. But we meet Tyler who has one important job of bringing in the board games as she yells to her mom in this creepy house while Owen plays outside with the dog. Absolutely Sigma male behavior. The mom is talking on the phone and she's discussing the current set of circumstances as Tyler continues unpacking the truck by herself while Owen runs off. She follows him and finds him on top of a barn. She tells him to get down before he's gonna hurt himself and I'm assuming this is what it's like having a sister, at least one that's older, because all I had were brothers growing up and we would just be daring one another to jump off high surfaces. And yes, we did get injured like quite frequently. So he jumps in the tick infested hay as everyone freaks out that he jumped into a bunch of hay. <laughs> okay. So as Pip the quadruped is staring into the woods whining, that kind of denotes that this is not a good thing. So hold on, we get a pan out. I have no idea where these people are, to be honest with you. Uh, they're in the woods, but then like, in the background of what we were looking at, it's mostly fields. Not sure how that works. Don't ask too many questions. Moving on. So they wrap up for the evening as the mom then heads downstairs, but the dog is continuing to act a little strange. Staring out the back door into the woods, I mean, that would be marginally concerning, but the next morning, the kids get dropped off at Padres, which again, the topography and geography changes so much. How are these people even remotely close to one another? It really doesn't matter. Most things don't matter, because now we get to watch two adults in the midst of a divorce struggle to talk to one another. It's like my childhood all over again. So the dad talks to the mom and then hands her a bunch of pictures, talking about how the lawyer wanted her to see these before he drops that thermonuclear warhead in the middle of the divorce. If you want my unsolicited advice, avoid divorce if you can. There's rarely an amicable way to like settle these things. So heading into work, another nurse tells Jessica about how she could have just, you know, stayed with her, but instead she chose the creepy rundown house owned by her great aunt. Nice. So Dr. Feelbad comes in and then says, hey, can you tell that patient that she has thyroid cancer down the hallway because I really don't want to? Which, okay, yeah, just pile it on Jessica, who cares? Cancer is also just honestly a biological punk ass. Later that day, the pre-adults then head out to the lake on their land with some fishing poles so they can catch some fish as they talk about their mother and why she's so concerned with Owen and all that good stuff. As they crest the hill, they see the lake is completely gone and all that is left is a thick mud and a dead tree and also a mystery skeleton. The dog then begins barking as they spot the skeleton in the water as the dog then gets loose and runs into the mud immediately face planting. As they pull themselves out and escape what would just be a, an annoying situation IRL, but with the right amount of music, I don't know, it could be a whomping willow. Who knows? So the tree then stands there menacingly doing nothing as the mother looks through the pictures handed to her earlier showing that she liked to party around three years prior. See? No amicable way forward. Couples counseling tends to help those things before you get to this point though. So, you know, if you're having issues, check into that. But Jessica spots her pre-adults and is angry they are muddy, but that's just sort of what pre-adults do. They sit down to dinner and apparently the mother didn't remove the olives from the spaghetti sauce and we get some information. The dad apparently took care of them much more than the mother because she was you know, partying. So somehow she got the kids for the time being. Okay, nice. So Owen mentions how she loves him more than Tyler. And then they all laugh like, ha ha, that's hilarious. But you're about to see how absolutely screwed this is about to be. Also, your parents do have a favorite. It's human nature. If you don't fall into that category, it's very apparent. She even says, oh, how did you know I love him more? Like a joke. She's not kidding. Moving on, the dog then continues to bark like a giant nerd at the back door towards the wood as Owen says, he sees something out there. 
I literally stopped the movie and watched through several times. I didn't see anything. But as soon as they open the door to look, Pippin then bolts out of there. Owen gives chase before running into a barbed wire fence and then has to give up his chase. He waits for the dog outside, but it does not return. Owen says he's going in there to look and then accuses his mother of not grabbing him because she doesn't love Pippin as the father got them the dog. Good lord, this kid is absolutely brutal. So now I'm not saying you should like, you know, hit a pre-adult. Like, I don't even know if I can say that on YouTube. Anyways, we're just gonna drop that line of thought. So Mon then tells him to go inside as he has his little re attack over it. And the next day we get more lawyer fun time as the dad questions the mom about how much she actually knows about the kids. We now learn that the dad hooked up with a nanny because Jessica was going on benders. That makes both of you wrong. But Jessica stops off at a pound to see if Pippin's there, you know, trying to be a good parent. He's not. She then heads home as Tyler tells her that Owen ran off to look for the dog, which you should just go ahead and assume that's probably going to be the case anyways. Finding Owen putting up lost dog flyers in the fields area pretty far away. Again, I don't understand this topography. She tells him to get into the car, but he doesn't want to listen. Owen then hits Jessica with some knowledge about how he knows why dad left her, which is even more brutal. But that night, well, looky there, Pippin returns. Running outside? Hmm. You know, Pippin may apparently have gone full Pet Cemetery or Cujo, which, fun fact, in the 1970s Pet Cemetery that was filmed in my town. And that town still looks just as creepy. Now, well, some of it was filmed here. Anyways, looking at Pippin, the Tapetum Lucidum appears a little more altered. Pippin then attacks Owen and bites him in the carotid artery as the mom then takes out the dog, and Owen is brought to the emergency room where we are now. Chubby emu female version comes... <laughs> It starts administering emergency blood to the youngling as the mom has some nice flashbacks to the dog biting her offspring. So I did this in an earlier video. I enjoyed adding like the science to the summary, mainly because there's no way to escape the science itself. We all know this. People tend to click off after the summary is over by like 50%. So here we go. Either this is going to ruin the summary for you or you're going to learn something. Rabies, as we all know, is my favorite disease in the world. And by favorite, I mean it should be eradicated with such precision and derision that other diseases will literally fear humanity for what we have done. Rabies is a mammalian disease with the only species seemingly unaffected by its presence being bats. But because our canine companions like to occasionally get into fights with like other animals who may be in fact currently infected with rabies, they tend to get it. And because we associate with our furry friends, we get it as well. Rabies in and of itself will alter a person's behavior in many ways, but not to the point of appearing feral like animals do. The reason is our large frontal lobes and powerful cerebrums. Even when altered by a virus, we are still able to somewhat emotionally control ourselves before we succumb to an illness. Upon being infected by rabies, it will use the neurons as a sort of roadmap to the central nervous system. Upon getting into the spinal cord, it will latch onto a specific mechanism and then will propel it quickly to the brain, where it is near 100% lethal once you start showing symptoms. I say near because a handful of people, like I think on one hand, have survived. But this is so astronomically rare, it is almost not even worth mentioning. Upon entering the brain, the actual behavior is altered through things like encephalitis or brain swelling. In animals, this is quite painful and can increase aggression, which is by natural compulsion going to lead them to bite. Rabies will increase the salivation of the animal as well because it has infected the salivary glands, which is how it spreads. In humans, it is not spread by bites as the person is still there and they are not really compelled to bite another person just for funsies. When Pip came back, it's interesting to note that A, it only took a few days for his symptoms to progress into the stage he was in, and B, the eyes appear to have somewhat changed. Eye changes are not known to happen with rabies concerning the tapetum lucidum. However, the behavioral changes are quite similar to that of a rabies infection, which does note at the possibility of some form of encephalitis. But there is one major thing that I'd like to bring up before we continue moving on, transmission. So here we see when Owen was attacked by the canine and bitten, clearly this is the vector and this is the infection point. This means that the saliva of the dog has the virus present. However, what we will see later may hint at the possibility of an imperfect host scenario. So back to the summary. The dad now shows up as they go to check on Owen. He accuses Jessica of being a bad parent over this, which I get the anger, but my man, you don't know what actually happened. So the next morning, Pippin wakes up and appears to be doing much better. He awakens hungry, but doesn't like the food as it smells weird. Changes in taste as well as hunger being present, but refusing to eat because food may smell odd denotes several changes happening internally within Owen. First, much like the virus that has been around for the last few years, we are beginning to find that there is a genetic component towards those who have a lost sense of smell or a lost sense of taste. Taste itself is mostly smell-based, which is processed in the olfactory bulb. Upon infection with the current virus, the neurons themselves are attacked, and in some, they did not recover as quickly, or possibly not even at all. In fact, I got a buddy who caught it 
I think was like prior to me catching it and still hasn't completely regained his sense of smell, but his brother got his back after two weeks. I believe this was like two or three years ago at this point. Meanwhile, when I contracted the virus just shortly after, my sense of smell and taste was never really affected. Using a similar line of thinking as to this, we can conclude that the blood virus is in fact present in the brain shortly after infection. Once the carotid artery was bitten, which goes to the brain because remember, arteries go towards tissues and veins go towards the heart the virus would slip past the blood-brain barrier and likely begin the infection of the neurons themselves directly. What I find interesting, however, is how it affects the behavior of those afflicted, but also how it impacts the primary functions of eating. Within just a few days post-infection, the olfactory bulb is now interpreting normal food as repulsive, likely brought on by the viral infection, infiltrating and destroying neurons within the olfactory bulb. The presence of this illness would likely also begin to have a low-level effect in swelling on the brain, that takes a much longer time to ramp up, likely due to the cells being subdued when alerting the immune system of its presence. As we all know, certain viruses can in fact silence the cell that is infecting so that let's say a T cell doesn't come by and read the MHC complex, say, hey, you're producing viruses, I don't like that, and then makes it explode to prevent more viral replication. However, if it's too aggressive, this can lead to the end of the host as the body is inundated with a massive viral load and subsequently succumbs to the illness that appears to have come from nowhere. This is fundamentally a dance the virus must play in order to keep you healthy enough to infect others, but also still replicate within your meat suit with enough to gain a foothold, but also be quiet enough as to not trigger your body into a full-on conflict with the virus. It's all very orchestrated. Viruses are creepy. Back to the summary, Jessica is then pulled away for her job as she then has to go talk to Miss Osgood again, but Miss Osgood isn't about this life. She starts asking essentially if Jessica can like check her out of the game early because her life is pretty depressing. She says she went home and had nobody to call. Very depressing. But as Jessica amps her up to stay alive, her son then starts coding in the next room, so she runs over there to assist. Owen is seizing on the ground, throwing up the food that he had eaten, as they then administer anti-seizure medication to get him stabilized. The doctors at this point are stumped as to what to do, so they just run a general swath of tests, starting with everyone's favorite virus, at least my virus, of course, rabies. And that's what's tested first, along with some other bacteria. Rabies comes back negative pretty quickly, but they assume it must be some form of anemia, which basically he doesn't have enough red blood cells. Jessica then talks about how tiny Owen was when he was born and how much she loves him and how Tyler is an annoyance. Real parenting power play stuff. But moving over to anemia real quick, because again, you know, I'm enjoying the science aspect. What is causing that? Well, as we will learn a little later on, Owen is at the point that he's experiencing a ridiculous amount of vitamin deficiencies, but this anemia highlights another issue within the body. Typically anemia that is caused by vitamin issues means that you're just having trouble building red blood cells. However, the blood virus appears to also be attacking the bone marrow itself. Now things like B12 deficiency and folate lead to a lack of healthy red blood cells for your information, but having moved into the marrow, it's clear that even though one of its targets would be nervous tissue, bone marrow tissue is definitely something that it wants to go after, and it's gonna create this anemia because you're not gonna have red blood cells. With the marrow under attack, this would lead Owen down a worse path. He would begin to need more blood in order to stabilize himself, but not in the way that you would think. The transfusions do appear to have helped stabilize him to begin with, which is likely causing a viral explosion accelerating his infection as his own body became depleted of red blood cells naturally. Adding in more just sort of pushed the newly contracted virus to new heights. Jessica gets a phone call and then heads back outside to talk to dad extraordinaire as Owen extubates himself and starts drinking the blood near him. Jessica would turn around and see this and obviously was a little weirded out and then hides the blood as the doctor comes back in. By drinking the blood, his breathing is better and he's massively resistant to sedation. Jessica then brings him more food, but he doesn't want it. He straight up just starts asking for blood at this point. Definitely a Sigma male grind set. The dad then shows up with a bear as Jessica tells the dad that he's apparently rebounding. The doctor says her best guess as to why he's better is the virus caused the anemia and his body was just able to wipe it out. Ah, yes. Now where did I put that medical degree? So the nanny that looks suspiciously like my ex-girlfriend, dad, and Jessica all stand there fairly jazzed about the news. The doctor wants to keep him till the end of the week to make sure that he keeps improving, but later that night, improvements disimprove. His vitals start going crappy again as doctors come in and administer the usual methods. But Jessica has a more unorthodox approach. She goes and checks out some blood, which O negative is the universal donor, if you didn't know. O positive is the universal recipient. As she pulls the blood out, he takes it and his vitals immediately get better. Somehow Jessica then convinces the doctors that she should take him home and then they just move him over there before she grabs a bunch of blood and then nopes out of there. 
Jessica tells Owen that he straight up cannot tell anyone about this. I'm assuming she thinks that maybe his body can clear the infection on its own, but absolutely not. She then sends his blood to a doctor as they think it's just anemia, but they cannot determine what exactly is causing it. So hold on. If the virus is a blood virus, why exactly can they not be found in the blood themselves? Well, strap in because this is both interesting and alarming how we actually sort of suck at identifying infections. The standard way of figuring out what virus you were infected with is an antigen test. Antigens are essentially the virus itself. By testing for this specific virus, you can determine its presence. But the issue lies in the fact that if you are tested for a known virus, and that comes back negative while you clear that infection checkbox, you are still infected with something unknown. It's clear that this infection is brand new in humans, and because of this, an antigen test would basically be completely useless as it may be present in the blood, but there is no way for the doctor to actually identify it. Also, just something for you to kind of snack on. Information-wise, did you know that red blood cells have no MHC complexes? At least not noticeably. And this is a good thing because otherwise blood transfusion would be about as difficult as it would be with like an organ transplant. So this would mean that the virus is actually replicating in not blood cells, but blood cells are being destroyed. So it may be replicating in other tissues. So the second test is known as a nucleic acid amplification test. And this will take free floating RNA or DNA of the virus and test it against known genetic material to confirm if the virus is present in the body. But once again, the issue is if the virus is a complete unknown, it is incredibly difficult to confirm the presence of any known infection. So what you have is a doctor completely unsure of what the patient has in their blood, but outward symptoms like the presentation of them clearly show they are infected with at least something. And this is why you don't take your pre-adult home and just assume they're all good, they're gonna clear this infection. The absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. With all that said, what's even worse is when the doctor she speaks to over the internet about the blood samples later on confirms there's nothing known in the blood, he is hinting that likely there is something there, they just need more information. There are special tests recently developed, I believe as of like 2019, up at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, those were the ones that took on this task of trying to figure out how exactly do you confirm the presence of a virus that may not cause any symptoms and is completely unknown. Utilizing sequencing techniques, they were able to essentially figure out completely new families of viruses that we simply did not know about a few years ago, which is exactly what the mom should have done. Should have taken them to Pennsylvania. Just avoid Philadelphia. I think that's in Pennsylvania, right? You're very likely to get stabbed by a crackhead. As Jessica then heads downstairs, Owen has broken into the blood supply, which now requires Jessica to go get more blood. Heading back to the hospital, the ability to get blood has been cut off as someone has assumed they're stealing blood. I mean, it's like, how how is all this blood going bad and just disappearing? Anyways, losing that ability, Jessica goes and gets a rabbit and then takes it out giving Owen the blood. Tyler then comes back home and Owen is once again sick on the couch chilling. Tyler asks what's for dinner and as we see, Jessica has got a whole lot of a rabbit operation going on in the basement. Giving Owen more rabbit blood, it isn't going as well as she hopes as he then passes out and starts convulsing on the ground and here we see something interesting. The mom cuts her hand and gives him human blood to bring him out of whatever he's in and he starts feasting on her arm and despite him drinking her blood, she ultimately does not become infected. Which again, intriguing. We will talk about that later when we get to the actual disease profile. But this presents an interesting challenge and an issue raised. If the concept were blood is blood, this means that in theory, Owen should have been able to feed on the rabbit blood with very little issue. However, upon drinking it, it shows us the internal metabolic processes that are taking place. Typically, the lore associated with vampirism is that those who do not want to go full vampire, because you never go full vampire, will drink the blood of animals rather than humans, and will be stronger than a human, but at an operating capacity, they're much more decreased compared to other vamps. With this in mind, Owen drinking the blood seems to have a much more profound impact in a worse way, which induces a seizure. So the question is, why is this happening? And furthermore, past that, how was his own mother not infected when he fed on her? To understand this, we must take a look at the actual blood composition, which will help us grasp why all blood is not created equal and why the mother may have actually been a perfect source of blood for him. And don't worry, we will be getting back to the summary in a second. Uh, also, I've noticed on this channel when we end up talking about very similar things in streaks, we talked about blood not too long ago, so we're talking about it again. Interesting. Anyhow, as it appears that the blood Owen is drinking normally is O negative because he himself is O negative, as we all know, again, O negative essentially means that the RH factor or rhesus factor is absent, so it's negative. This is an inherited protein found on the surface of red blood cells, where in Owen's case, it was not inherited, so he is O negative. 
The RH factor is inherited by either the mother or the father, meaning that when he drinks the mother's blood, he is likely receiving a similar blood type or RH factor, although this may not be totally important as he can also drink the blood of other humans with different types of blood types quite easily. Although this isn't confirmed because all we ever see him drink is O negative and considering, you know, he comes from his mother, his mother may be O negative as well. So the issue with other animals' blood is they do not completely have the same blood systems that we have. Our blood types are denoted by antigen presence, antigen A, B antigen, and O having neither antigen present. Also, I did just want to clear something up because I can't remember if I said this or not, but O positive is not a universal acceptor of blood. You can only get O blood. So I, if you've made it this far without writing that comment, because I do not know where I said that, uh, thank you for waiting before writing that comment. Anyways, back to it. So back in the day, rabbits were injected with primate blood or rhesus monkeys, and the rabbits developed a strong immunological reaction to the primate blood. So that brings up an interesting question. If the rabbits had a strong reaction to primate blood and the subsequently later also had a strong reaction to human blood, would it work the other way around? And the answer is yes. We already see this reaction with humans currently, and this is known as a transfusion allergy, which can cause a person to break out in hives or have issues breathing, as their body is literally having an allergic reaction to the blood that they put into the circulatory system. When Owen drinks the blood of the rabbit, he's fine at first, but ultimately this forces him into a state of anaphylactic shock brought on by the blood. And this would also denote something else interesting about Owen, the possible addition of unknown organs. If you drink blood, you will get sick. That's because blood you drink isn't just absorbed into your bloodstream. It is destroyed by the stomach acid, which it's quite difficult for the body to break it down due to the issue of protein composition. But much like with the tapetum lucidum in Owen's eyes, which we'll get to here momentarily that formed, I believe there must be other internal organs when he feeds on blood that brings the blood directly into the bloodstream. Because of this, the allergic reaction is immediate and nutrients in the blood gained from victims is transferred to keep him alive normally. Back to the summary. So the mom goes to bed at like 7 p.m. because she's low on blood and realizes that she needs to make a blood donation to her son if he's going to survive. Yeah, I don't know about that one, Chief. The next morning, the dad shows up to pick up the kids, but Jessica is losing days at a time at this point as she assumes it's a school day, but it's actually Saturday. Also, those track marks on her arm from giving blood uh, to her local vampire organization make the dad a little sketched out considering her party hard years. So... They head out to go bowling, of all things, as the dad then takes off with the younglings in his sweet Toyota Tundra. I'm partial to the third-gen forerunners myself. I have one, but Toyota supremacy is a real thing. So, mom has a nice nap on the lawn, waking up several hours later, when she gets some blood flow back to her brain, but she's not operating too well. We now meet Mrs. Osgood once again. She wants to die and pump herself full of chemicals, but your punishment must be more severe, Miss Osgood. Jessica goes to extract some blood from her before the doctor shows up and ruins the plan. So Jessica is forced to donate more blood to Owen as she almost burns down the entire house from being totally out of it. Turns out you do need your blood. You can actually supplement saline to help fill back up the lost volume, but without all the necessary red blood cells to supply oxygen, you will be knocked more and more out of it as time passes and you keep donating more blood. Remember, Blood volume can be replaced in 24 hours. Cells take six to eight weeks to fully return. So the next day, the doctor asks about Owen and says there was no known viral infection. The doctor wants to have him kind of brought in for another blood analysis. Because of this conversation, this interrupted Jessica's plan to move Mrs. Osgood somewhere as she is apparently checking out. Like not checking out of life, but just checking out the hospital. She finds her outside and says that, oh, I'll drive you where you need to go. And Jessica at this point is assuming Miss Osgood still wants out of life. So, I mean, taking her blood isn't that big of a deal. However, of course, Miss Osgood wants to live now. Jessica can't have that, so she stops the car and then knocks her out with some of her own supply. Taking her home, Owen watches like a weirdo while the mom gets Miss Osgood ready for her donation. She tells her exactly why she is doing this, which likely isn't very comforting. Tyler comes home and finds a padlock on the basement door, which is probably a little alarming. Tyler then tells Jessica that the teachers are asking when Owen is coming back to school, as she protests, saying that she has to be super ill to miss school. As the mom says, well, yeah, I like him more. Yes, guarantee did not cause a complex in your offspring. I think maybe Jessica is just kind of a trash mother. That evening, Jessica brings Miss Osgood some food, but she doesn't want to eat and has to use the bathroom. Didn't think of that one. She then hands her a bowl as Miss Osgood calls her a monster. Bathroom trip denied. Heading back upstairs, Tyler is walking around like a creepazoid and starts questioning what's down there. That night, Owen comes in the room asking for more blood. He can't sleep. He needs to feed. His eyes have begun changing just like Pippin's as he mentions how he likes the blood warm. See, that's just a preference at this point. You can drink it cold 
and you'll like it. So here's where we get the biggest hint that this is in fact a virus, though I do wonder how this genetic information was acquired, so let's get to it. The Tapetum lucidum exists in many different species, but the ones we are most familiar with are cats and dogs. That light in the back of their eyes that catches if you look at it just right with the multicolor shimmer, this covering on the back of their retinas is there as when it's dark and they are hunting, it will reflect the light coming through, giving the retinas a second chance to pick up that light, allowing them to become better nocturnal hunters and also avoid danger in the dark themselves. The sight of an animal at night is much better than a human's for a reason. After Pip was infected, we see his Tapetum lucidum has turned a deep yellow color, although this is already common in dogs, so it's quite possible Pip already had this color initially. However, it's now much more visible, indicating that a photoreflective layer has grown since he initially ran off. When Owen begins exhibiting the same structure, this would likely indicate that after Pip was infected, the virus would have been altered to a degree by the genetics of the canine. This actually happens pretty regularly. Viruses do not just inject their own genetic material and then just move on with their lives. Viruses will regularly pick up the genes from the host as this helps hone their own infection patterns. When this virus was able to spread to Owen by the bite, it's fairly clear that some of the canine genetics also went into him. I do wonder if this had an impact in other ways, such as increased sense of smell and better hearing as well as the presumed night vision. The next morning, Tyler has had enough of this mystery. Looking at the padlock, she then heads outside through the window and finds out what's down there. Finding Miss Osgood, she ungags her, but her mom comes home shortly afterwards, forcing her to hide. Jessica realizes that Miss Osgood couldn't have ungagged herself, so she assumes Tyler is down there. This is why your mom doesn't love you. She finds Tyler and then grabs her and then tells her she's going to explain what's going on, which Tyler actually accepts it pretty well, actually. Tyler tells her it's not right, though, but Jessica has all of the rationalization. Well, this is going to require years of therapy. Later that day, Tyler asks what blood tastes like. Hmm, tastes like copper. He asks what's going to happen to him, and, well, it appears that you just straight up have a disease, my boy. He says that he looks and feels different. I'd say so. Dad arrives in that pretty sick tundra. This is actually making me want a tundra. The product placement is working on me. They go fishing for the day where everyone praises Owen for getting a fish. In the middle of this high praise, the nanny then punctures her thumb on a hook as the dad literally sucks the blood off of it. Yeah, no thanks. There's just no need to do that. It was a small wound. The dad then requests Owen go get a med kit from his truck. It's a puncture wound from like a hook. Like what even is this? Just let it coagulate for a second, good lord. Also, stop sucking the blood off of it. Mm, that always bugs me. There's a lot of diseases in blood. And I know if you're like hooking up with somebody, yeah, it is what it is. But like, there's that's just so extra. You don't have to do that. But this dad has weirded me out from the beginning. And he weirded out my wife when we were watching this. So anyways, like people don't do this. And if you do, that's a great way to just not be a weirdo anymore and just don't do that. Anyhow, Owen has an attack because he's seeing and smelling blood, but eventually he snaps out of it. Meanwhile, back in the Bates Motel basement, Miss Osgood starts using some mental tactics on Jessica. She says that she understands why Jessica is doing this, and she wants to stay to get her to let her guard down. She then grabs some scissors and stabs her in the arm. Should have gone for the head, IMO. But as she slowly makes her way upstairs because she basically has no blood left, Jessica gets her in the basement with a lamp and knocks her out. But as she does, the cops have shown up. Yeesh, the timing. Heading upstairs, the cop asks if she knows Helen Osgood. There is footage of Jessica literally taking Miss Osgood. Jessica turns around saying that, well, she tried to take herself out, so she wonders if she went somewhere more private to end herself. Miss Osgood gets her gag off at this point and yells for the cops, but they're like, yeah, that checks out. You're probably right. So they just go ahead and leave, even though she was the last person seen with her. And there's no way that they really care that much. Yep, that sucks. So now Miss Osgood is on the offensive once more. Knocking over her sedation cocktail after she wakes up, she's able to clear it enough to actually get up and get out there. Meanwhile, during the ride back, Tyler tells Jessica that yeah, Owen's kind of just getting worse and he needs more and more to stay normal. Miss Osgood then gets a stroke of luck, breaking the bed and freeing herself from her restraints. She heads upstairs, running on like a pint of blood at this point, but adrenaline is some pretty sweet stuff. She breaks the door and then goes to make a run for it. This part's rather confusing, just like the topography. They say that they were driving, or we, we saw that they were driving at night. Well, it looks like complete day out there to me. I mean, it is bright, and that has got to be like an 8,000 lumen porch light otherwise. I don't know. Which, uh, based on the fact that the light is coming from behind them in the yard, I don't know, man. This doesn't make much sense. Seems like daytime. So Miss Osgood then goes out the back door to escape them as Tyler realizes that she has made a break for it. Heading outside, Jessica goes the wrong way, but Owen sees her. Miss Osgood then runs and hits a barbed wire fence, piercing her jugular, but by the appearance of the low pressure, I mean, she's already on like 1% health by this point, so 
Uh, sneezing wrong would have probably taken her out. But as Jessica finds her, Owen is already snacking on her as he turns around and hisses at her. See, this is why you, like, when you find a vamp, you just take him out then and there. You don't feed it and try to change it. If you give a vampire a liter of blood, just like if you give a mouse a cookie. Now, as mentioned earlier, because of the influence of possibly other genetics gained from the canine using the virus as sort of an infection vessel for this, I do wonder if visually the changes we are starting to see are really being brought on by things like encephalitis or maybe the body is being influenced by a foreign genome, which is that of an animal, and subsequently that is causing him to behave more like an animal the longer the infection goes and his cells are fundamentally changed. So, back to the summary later on. She cleans the blood off of him in a bathtub, which sort of seems like a shower scenario. She then heads out to go bury Miss Osgood and takes some pills for the evening to go to bed. Tyler passes by Owen's room and sees that he's standing there menacingly. I wouldn't want to be in that house with that thing. As she then goes to sleep on the couch with her mom. The next morning, as Tyler stands over the dog's grave, she decides to go and check out what's the deal with the lake, assuming the dog went there. That leaves Jessica alone with Owen, who is, of course, hungry once again. I swear, they each had a house and home. Approaching the tree, Tyler is sketched out. As Jessica then goes and gives Owen blood, he needs more and more to stay satiated. Again, just take the vamp out. Now, this is intriguing because if the hypothesized new organ is to be believed, which allows for blood to directly enter his bloodstream, there is likely a viral explosion taking place in the bloodstream requiring more blood to sustain its production, utilizing specifically the red blood cells as its breeding ground, potentially. I also think there's probably other tissues more so involved, but it's likely that this isn't just a runaway process and there may be a theoretical ceiling to the infection, but he has yet to hit it. Instead, the blood he is receiving is too little, but enough to invoke the hunger in him due to nutrient deficiencies. Looking into the tree hole, it appears to be leaking a black substance as Tyler can hear faint whispering. Now, is there a supernatural aspect to this? It does seem like it. Though it'll never be expanded on, I am afraid to say. Jessica is then awoken by a knock. This part made my wife laugh because apparently this is not how it actually works. The Youngling Protective Services has arrived with the dad to take the pre-adults away. Again, I know this is stupid, but I have to dance around the word, otherwise commons get auto-disabled by bots. Owen has missed too much school, and Tyler also isn't back at school either. Tyler then arrives as she tries to tell Jessica uh, something, as then they bring Owen down. He looks fine, so that doesn't look good on Jessica, but it looks good otherwise. Tyler questions what they should do about Owen because he's clearly getting worse. Tyler says there's something at the lake also, something is in the tree, and it got inside of Owen. On the ride over, Owen basically downs all the blood that he had, great thinking, as the adults then head into the kitchen to discuss the Tyler wants to destroy the mystery tree. Owen then hears baby music in the next room and goes in there to get some veal, but it's stopped by Tyler before he can do the deed. Tyler and Owen then head out to go destroy that tree. Biking over, the dad realizes pretty quickly that they are gone and goes to Jessica's to look for him. He finds Jessica passed out on the couch. Probably not a good look. And the dad then finds a padlock on the door, which, I mean, that would probably sketch me out, I'm not gonna lie. But then again, I really wouldn't know what the house was for. Like, or like what, what condition it was in. Maybe the padlock was already there. I, it seems like an overreaction. He heads down there as Jessica then heads outside to the lake. As Tyler and Owen walk along, Tyler says someone had already tried to burn down the tree prior, which is why it looks the way it does. But they are going to finish it and whatever is in there will leave Owen alone. As she says this though, Owen stops. You see, the music simply made him lose control. He begins his attack on Tyler, chasing her through the woods towards the lake. This loss of control indicates likely several things currently taking place within his body. First, the nutrient deficiencies. Have you ever been like really hungry? And I'm not talking about like, oh yeah, I could eat, but literally famished. Something takes over. I remember one time I was on keto, right? It was about seven days at this point, and I was in a caloric deficit and I had like maybe five grams of carbohydrates for that day maximum. I woke up in the middle of the night with this just indescribable hunger. I did it to myself by eating so little, but I went to the pantry to have a keto snack to satiate it, but as I was standing there, it's like another portion of my brain took over, likely because it did, the self-preservation side. I grabbed everything and literally binged probably around 4,500 calories inside the hours from 2 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. I woke up on the couch still clutching a Cheeto bag. Now, the thing about this is it's very likely I was short key nutrients. My heart was absolutely pounding when I woke up, which says I likely had a potassium deficiency, which isn't good. My muscles were weak, so, I mean, obviously my electrolytes were in short supply. My hypothalamus had literally wrestled control away from my willpower section of my brain to eat something immediately. It was a very bizarre experience because I had never had anything happen like that before or since. You realize at the end of the day, your body typically will not allow itself to perish, and this is likely what Owen was feeling. We will go into his reasoning here in a moment. 
Player three has now entered the game, and at this point she hears Tyler screaming and then runs towards the lake. Finding Owen just prior to biting her, she's able to tackle him and put him in the mud. Also, realizing that he's going goblin mode, he comes to before succumbing once again and losing control. She pushes him down into the mud, drowning him, and then screeches at the tree. So, Tyler cries about it for a while as Jessica tells her we could never tell anyone what happened here. I don't know, man. It doesn't seem like this would actually favorably go well for Jessica. Uh, but somehow the death was ruled an accident, and then the dad is going forward with a negligence claim because Owen had a massive deficiency of calcium, vitamin C, and vitamin D at the time of his end. So Jessica now gets supervised visitation four days a month, or, uh, you know, roughly four days a month, and maybe in six months to a year, things could change, but not likely. After meeting with Tyler for a little while, she ends up going back to the tree to properly burn it down like a true Alpha Stacy. But it's not the end yet. Playing with the dog named Jericho, it looks out into the woods as whatever is out there isn't done yet. So is it supernatural or not? So let's round this thing out by discussing the last three points, I suppose. What does a vitamin deficiency actually do to your body, and what are the effects? Was Owen an imperfect host for the infection? And ultimately, was this supernatural? Vitamin deficiencies are absolutely insidious for most of humans all throughout human history. We weren't even aware of really what they were, so you would just basically drop sometimes. and People are like, oh, well, I guess it was your time when really you just needed to eat like an apple. So we know we have to eat, but we didn't necessarily know what we were supposed to eat. On ships actually crossing the ocean, scurvy, for instance, which allowed for a weakened immune system and also let old wounds reopen, would take out many a crewman more so than just the danger of the open ocean. It was eventually discovered that lemons could prevent this illness, but not before many people would lose their lives. Scurvy is caused by a vitamin C deficiency and can have the aforementioned consequences, and as it gets worse, you eventually fall into complete decompensation and draw your last breath. The typical symptoms are having dry hair, dry skin, which we clearly see on Owen and him displaying this more the infection goes, and he would also be displaying flu-like symptoms as well as a tendency to bruise and bleed easily, as without vitamin C, wounds won't heal much more slowly and clotting factors are less effective. This is one of the deficiencies that Owen had. The other was vitamin D deficiency. Now typically your skin coming into contact with sunlight and specifically UV radiation, your body will produce all the vitamin D that you really need for the day with roughly about 20 minutes of sunlight exposure over a larger area of your body. Without it, the issues start to mount rather quickly. Fatigue, bone pain, muscle weakness, as well as cramps and general aches. The mood of a person can also be heavily impacted leading to depression. And this is why seasonal affective disorder or SAD is a thing because people get much less sunlight in the winter, which is necessary for biological operations. So if you find yourself feeling sad or depressed, I'm not saying going outside will fix it, but it's well known that the sun and nature, like nature sounds in general, help depression as you are receiving vitamin D. A supplement is also gonna work fairly well if you cannot get outside for one reason or another. But with this vitamin D deficiency, it does show something else is happening in his body as well. In order to survive, likely his bones would begin suffering the effects of the infection, and with the bone marrow clearly under attack as well, leading to anemia, Owen would be exhibiting some pretty severe consequences brought on by this virus. To add to these issues, a deficiency in calcium was also noted in his autopsy, which can lead to extreme fatigue as well, which considering he was sleeping all the time, you can quite literally see that he was having a symptomatic attack. Along with all this, it can lead to insomnia or inability to sleep and a feeling of sluggishness. His ability to focus would be heavily impacted, along with the presentation of dizziness, brain fog, forgetfulness, and confusion. And this is because without calcium, or at least a deficiency of calcium, the electrical signals that usually flow quite easily down the axon are hindered. This stops electrical firing in the cerebrum and makes the brain run at a decreased capacity. With this inhibited, memory formation and emotional control would be severely hindered as well. We see this when Owen talks about how he can't fight it because just like when I was overcome by the binge eating like <laughs> demon influence in the early morning, his cerebrum is in counterbalancing the more animalistic drive that is forming in him to not starve to death, making him more aggressive. But this brings us to our next question. Was Owen an imperfect host? So here's what I find odd about the whole infection. How it's passed along, but also not passed along in other ways. We know with the dog, its infection likely began when it face planted into the mud, or at least that's where I'm thinking it began. Judging by the skeleton that was lying in the mud as well, another animal had already become infected and had contaminated the mud with the infection, or hypothesized anyways. I believe that's why that skeleton is there. This was likely accomplished by the tree itself, having had the lake water there, this spread the virus and then was encased in the mud when the lake dried up. 
Now, why did the lake dry up? That remains to be seen. But when the dog was staring into the woods or the lake, it was likely catching a whiff of something in the area. Now, I can hear you already. All right, Roanoke. Well, what's the deal with the tree and what's the deal with the whispering that Tyler heard? We shall get there momentarily. When Pip came back fully infected after a few days, he would go on to bite Owen in the neck, clearly transferring the infection to him. That is because animals such as deer, dogs, and cats in the area are likely or assumedly the preferred host. Humans, on the other hand, are not, but can still be infected. It's on a similar line of thinking as to say Toxoplasmosis gondii. I know that is a parasite, uh, and we were kind of discussing a virus, but it sort of tracks the same. Toxoplasmosis wants to infect birds of prey and felines by using mice to complete the life cycle. However, sometimes they end up in humans, where it can have an immunological impact on us, as well as induce behavioral changes but we are not the preferred host to continue its life cycle. This virus may operate similarly. It may be as simple as we do not have the proper tissues in place to effectively transfer the virus. This is a well-known phenomenon such as with human immunodeficiency virus and simian immunodeficiency virus because chimps infected with SIV do not have CD4 and CD8 T cells, if I'm remembering this correctly, so they don't have the illness progress into AIDS. But humans do have those cells, which causes the virus to uncontrollably reproduce until it destroys the immune system, leaving the person open to opportunistic infections. When Pip bit Owen, it shows that maybe he had the tissues necessary to transfer the disease. When Owen fed on his mother, it showed he lacked these tissues to transfer the disease, essentially making him a dead end for the infection. Which brings us up to our final point. Is this a supernatural infection? Well, that's a pretty good question, actually. And of course, it's me asking it, so that doesn't make me sound like a douche at all for saying that. The answer is possibly. See, there are several issues. First, the tree has an ominous presence, and apparently someone had already tried to burn it down before and broke open the lake, completely draining it. This is evidently Jessica's aunt who had done so, and when Tyler comes into contact with the tree later, she can hear whispering, which then freaks her out, and the dog is alerting to something in the woods like the whole time. Even at the end of the movie, Jessica's new dog was bitten by something in the woods, showing that burning down the tree did nothing, and whatever it is, is still out there. Although here's the thing, while the whisper would suggest something unknowable, the sinister thing in the woods that bit the second dog just suggests there is a contractible infection in the soil of the lake and something else had come into contact with it and had been infected themselves. So here's what I'm inclined to believe. The infection itself makes animals anemic and encodes for new organs that are able to then take in blood and add it into the animal's bloodstream for nourishment. This is desirable as the virus itself would propagate in a specific species as that individual is then driven to attack those of its own species, potentially spreading the infection. In a cross-species incident, the disease is not able to jump as well as it normally would and then adapt to a new animal entirely, and this leads to like a hindered form of the infected that is not able to progress the disease onto a second generation of uninfected. The virus itself exists within the soil of the lake, infecting animals that come by, making it a mundane disease. The supernatural element of how animals are drawn in to begin with and to be infected, while it does not appear to want to draw in humans, it does want to in fact draw in other animals, potentially through a sound created, which makes them curious. Is this supernatural or just something that is not understood by humans yet? Supernatural. It's definitely supernatural. Because as we know, a virus does not make a perceptible noise to any animal. That means whatever is drawing the animals in is using the virus to spread its influence. But to what end, I am not sure. Either way, strangely, humans do not appear to be the main target. But then again, that's a very human thing to say, assuming all things evil want to corrupt only humanity. You know, it's because we're the center of the universe. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, the leaving a like would be fantastic, and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. Let me know what you guys thought about this style of video. The summary and science are more blended together, which I do like a lot, but I'm not... I don't know about the still frames, man. It's just the copyright is getting absolutely insane lately. Anybody can do anything, and you're just screwed. It's... It's not y'all's problem. Anyways, I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and channel links in the description for all those interested. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death Dancer. Thanks, my man. I'd also like to thank our scientists, Chad W., Lacune, Logan Satomi, and Tyson Nakanishi. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running and is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and we'll see y'all in the next one.